Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this, um, this panel, which promises to be quite wonderful. Uh, if you can, I'd like you to put in the chat room your name and where you come from uh, to give us a sense of where who's listening. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Craig Santos Perez, who is the editor of the anthology and also the moderator. Aloha. Aloha and half a day. Thank you so much, Roger, for that introduction and for inviting us to be part of the 2022 uh, Hawaii Book and Music Festival. We are honored to be here to celebrate the publication of this anthology, Indigenous Pacific Islander Eco Literatures, uh, just published in the past month by the University of Hawaii Press. I also want to uh, thank uh, Emma Ching in particular at UH Press for really supporting uh, this project and bringing it into fruition after we had worked on it for about seven years. I was honored to co-edit this anthology with uh, Kathy Jetno Kijner and Leora Kava. And um, you know, working with, with these two Pacific writers, scholars, and editors was, um, was a wonderful privilege and pleasure. Uh, before I introduce our, our speakers today, I wanted to share with you uh, the description of this anthology. And I'm also gonna put a link to it in the chat. And so if you're interested in, in ordering a copy and, and reading along, please feel free to, to click the link. In this anthology of contemporary eco-literature, the editors have gathered an ensemble of 100 emerging mid-career and established indigenous writers from Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and the global Pacific diaspora. This book itself is an ecological form with rhizomatic roots and blossoming branches. Within these pages, the reader will encounter a wild garden of genres, including poetry, chant, short fiction, novel excerpts, creative nonfiction, visual texts, and even a dramatic play, all written in multilingual offerings of Pacific languages, English, pidgin, and in translation. We organize this anthology into seven uh, main themes or chapters. These include creation stories and genealogies, ocean and waterscapes, land and islands, flowers, plants, and trees, animals and more than human species, climate change, and environmental justice. This aesthetic diversity embodies the beautiful biodiversity of the Pacific itself. The urgent voices in this book call us to attention to action at a time of great need. Pacific ecologies and the lives of Pacific Islanders are currently under existential threat due to the legacy of environmental imperialism and the ongoing impacts of climate change. While Pacific writers celebrate the beauty and cultural symbolism of the ocean, islands, trees, and flowers, they also bravely address the frightening realities of rising sea levels, animal extinction, nuclear radiation, military contamination, and even the pandemic. Uh, indigenous Pacific, Pacific Islander eco-literatures reminds us that we are not alone. We are always in relation and always ecological. Humans, other species, and nature are interrelated. Land and water are central concepts of Pacific identity and genealogy and earth is a sacred source of all life and thus should be treated with love and care. With this book as a trusted companion, we are inspired and empowered to reconnect with the world as we navigate towards a precarious yet hopeful future. So that's a little bit about the anthology, uh, how we conceptualize and organize it. And we are honored today to have uh, four of its amazing contributors here today, uh, all based uh, here in Hawaii, and their contributions to this anthology, uh, you know, for, for myself and the other editors, really just blew us away, and we're so honored to include their work. So I'm going to introduce the first uh, two uh, writers today. Travis T. 
is an award-winning Kanaka Korean spoken word poet and touring teaching artist from Kalihi, Honolulu, Oahu, Hawaii. As, a, as the only child of activist educators, he began performing his poetry at protest rallies and political demonstrations. He was a co-founder of the Re Versus Poetry Collective, co-founder and director for You Speaks Hawaii Pacific Tongues, and founding member of Hawaii Poet Society. Kamele Donaldson was raised in the Pacific Northwest as a Kanaka in diaspora. She currently attends the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she is pursuing her bachelor's degree in Olelo, Hawaii. She is a regular contributor to the Honolulu Spoken Word Poetry Community. So please give a virtual, virtual round of applause to Travis T and Kamele. Hola, my Palco. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Travis Kololao Thompson. I come to you live and direct from Kalihi Valley and um, sitting next to me. Aloha, well, Kamele Pu'uwei. No wukine kona mai yao. So happy to be here um, and happy to listen and just exist in this space. So mahalo to all you folks for coming and for putting on um, this panel and all the work you guys have done. So that's Kamele. I'm Travis. We have a team poem that we or a group piece that we'd like to share with you. And then we have um, one or two indies that we'd like to share as well. And um, and then yeah, we'll move on. Um, this first poem is called Go Home, Stay Home. And a little backstory, I guess it was written during the pandemic. It was pretty much written online in terms of we never like met to actually write the poem. And um, any statistics you hear in it are like frozen in time, of, like April of or like, when did we write it? April? Yeah, June. April. It was like April, April June. maybe even May of 2020, mm -hmm. right? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so any statistics you hear, that's, that's, that's when it was. OK. Any, any, anything else we need to remember? No. Okay. That's good. All right. So here we go. It goes like this. <clears throat> it goes, what, bra? No can hear. What, bro? No, like, listen. I don't care if round trip tickets to Honolulu is $115, nearly 3 million people are sick. I, I don't, don't care. care if that Airbnb in Lenny Kai was only 20 bucks a night. Over 200,000 people are dead. I, I don't, don't care, care if you think this global pandemic is just a hoax engineered by China and the Democrats. 200 million people are living under a stay at home order. So, so go home and stay, stay at home. home. Hey, tourists, stay, stay at home. home. Hey, college spring breakers, stay, stay at home. home. All non essential workers, stay, stay at home. home. After all, uninvited outsiders invading Hawaii has always been non-essential. Ever since Kanaka clubbed Captain Cook at Kealakakua Bay, outsiders invading Hawaii has always been about colonization. Has, has always, always been, been about capitalist interests. Has, has always, always been, been about stealing the land, kicking out Kanaka, turning our island into a parking lot for those willing to pay the price of paradise. But, but Hawaii, Hawaii is not, not your pandemic, pandemic playground hideaway. hideaway. Maybe you never hear when Governor Ige encouraged, encouraged tourists not to travel to Hawaii at this time. Maybe you never like listen when Mayor Caldwell encouraged all new arrivals to self-quarantine for 14 days. So we are here to make sure you hear us loud, loud and, and clear, clear as we encourage you to go, go home and stay home. home. So excuse me if I seem upset at the image of outsiders landing at Honolulu Airport during a global pandemic. Excuse, excuse me if I seem heated at the broadcast of Trump selling lies about Lysol and UV floodlight enemas. Excuse, Excuse me, me if I become triggered at the sight of body bags stacked on top of ice rinks because as Kanaka, I will tell you when outsiders invade Hawaii, it is we who have died in the hundreds of thousands. And, and we, we are, are not, not alone. alone. For many Pacific Islanders throughout Oceania, the diseases of progress and travel are all too familiar to us. 1778. Syphilis. 1804. Cholera. 1820. Influenza. 1839. Mumps. 1848. Measles. 1853. Smallpox, 1869, leprosy, 2020, COVID-19. In less than 100 years of the arrival of the West, nearly 90% of the native Hawaiian population was maki died dead. We chanted Kaniko and danced hula for the deceased, watching as our ohana cliff jumped from ha and a point, leaving footprints on the clouds at sunset to join our kupuna. But no longer shall we reserve our voices only for grieving the dead. No, no longer, longer shall we be silenced in the face of yet another deadly pandemic. No, no longer, longer shall we listen to make nice and show aloha. 
Make nice and show aloha. Make nice and show aloha. So tourists, stay home. Hey, college free breakers, stay home. All uninvited outsiders and non-essential workers, stay home. And all you racist invaders throughout Pacifica know that you are not wanted here. So, so go, go home and stay home. home. Hey. Woo. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo nui. Woo. It's such good fun. It is. It's, it's, a, it's fun. a good fun. It's like an old friend. You know what I mean? Putting that phone back on. It's like, did you break back to how angry we were at that moment? You know? <laughs> All right, you ready for your Andy or you want me to do yeah, it? Yeah, I can. I can it. Okay, let me find mine. All right. So I'm going to do one. This wasn't in the book, but this is something I wrote in the beginning of 2020 um, after a really awful conversation with a specific kind of person and you'll hear that in this poem um and this is uh, the amalgamation of that conversation i wrote it in 20 or 30 minutes and i've played with it since then but this is kind of my go-to piece um i don't have a title for it though so here we go five reasons why i won't date a white military man one, your boots stomp through our streets, your eyes envisioned a takeover, your lips feast on our bodies until you are satiated, your tongues are daggers to my kanakaness, your sonar disrupts our sea life, your artillery practice bullets through our mountainsides, your helicopter blades warp the air that my land breathes, and we can feel the earth shake as your tanks shove dust down our throats. Two, kiavalao o pu'uloa. Where all water sources of the 12 Ahupua'a within Kamoku'o Eva merge together. Kanaka and Aina living in synchronicity, a loving relationship called Sust Aina Bility, severed for coaling and repair in the Spanish American War for the US Navy. This place, we know it as Pearl Harbor, the moment we became merely a strategic vantage point and a simultaneous vacation destination, the driving force that allowed the United States to seize an illegal grip on our lands, from lush forests to paved battle wounds and singing birds to blaring horns instead of Lokoi'a, we have battleships. Instead of a thriving ecosystem, we have thriving militarism. So when I told you I won't date a military man and I'm careful not to mention white because that kind of thing can be fragile, you ask me why. Three, I tell you it's culturally and ancestrally traumatizing. So you give me the definition of trauma while also telling me that your uniform pushing my potent skirt to the side isn't trauma and your, your eyes brand red, white, and blue on my breast while you hiss that you're different then put your hand over your heart and sing the Star Spangled Banner. But I decide to tell you about the effects of militarism in Hawaii. You give me the definition of militarism and I tell you what it's like to be the sexually objectified product crafted as a commodity for this chaotic and capitalistic community that feeds the militarism in Hawaii. You give me the definition of militarism for you tell me Korea would nuke us, that we are incapable of survival without the U.S., that Japan would have taken over, that Hawaii is a state, and you have the audacity to tell me that I'm not Hawaiian simply because I wasn't born here, and you wonder why I don't date white military men five. You told me hula dancers are sexy. So I lied when you asked. I told you I danced hula and you asked me to do a nice little dance for you. And you said, I bet your hips move real nice and asked if I knew any grass huts to get down in. And you wonder why I don't date white military men. I wish I could say I was making this shit up, but it's a conversation stuck on repeat. This trauma is encoded in my DNA, two generations of white military men finding beautiful Hawaiian women, drowning their culture, suffocating their children's Maoli identities. And you wonder why my Tinder bio says, if you're military, don't hit me up. Mahalo. Thank you, Kamele. So Kamele has a family dinner that she needs to run to. Um, so, you know, is, are there any last words you want to say before you're out? Um, just mahalo well, for letting me be here. I wish I could stay, but my mom's in town from Washington and I don't get a lot of time with her. So mahalo everybody. I will definitely be watching um, Mary and Mahela and I'll be watching your stuff after and Travis T. But mahalo all of you and enjoy to, um, Travis's other indie. Don't, don't forget to scratch you. Yes. Mahalo right. everybody. Shoots.
Okay, so I got an indie. Well, this is actually um, a, a team poem that I originally wrote with a uh, brother we call the Godfather. His name is Jesse Lippman. He is a, um, a poet in the local spoken word poetry community. And he also works as um, in the healthcare providing industry and, um, and food service as well. But anyway, this poem is called um, The Ice is Melting. And it goes like this. It goes, somewhere outside, city streets are blanketed in sheets of black ice melting drip by drip. The atmosphere is changing. Somewhere outside, the snow is melting for the last time, streaming into currents, lost in storm drains, gutters of sickness, spilling back to a dead sea resurrected in fractions of inches, inviting itself inland, disappearing beaches. Somewhere outside grows a great Pacific garbage patch twice the size of Texas, the fish, are drowning in our undying plastic, drips become ripples. Somewhere outside, climate refugees are running from the tide, chasing them to higher ground while we ignore dripping faucets, wash our hands with blind faith in the market, flip carbon levels like condos because morals never mix properly with money. So the God we worship on our currency is the mirage of progress answering us like the prayers of an atheist because somewhere outside, Thick breeze carries us like dry salt to vultures scavenging on the carcass of empire. Parasitic profiteers and bottom line puppeteers prostitute our politics so we are debtors to a system anchored like an oil rig to the ocean's basin. Meanwhile, real global terrorists scalp entire rainforests, decapitate mountaintops. Real global terrorists damn rivers for ransom, hold resources for hostage. Real global terrorists Frack the seafloor in search of oil paved cities over floodplains because real global terrorists murder entire ecosystems. So catch your breath beneath the underbelly of our overconsumption. Cry me a merger when the rent's overdue. Sing me a bedtime lullaby in a refugee tent. Alexa, wail me a blues song for gentrified graveyards rising from the dead like landfills the size of mountains in the space between the Green New Deal and corporate interests. We've become non-recyclable waste. Somewhere outside, polar bears cling to Arctic glaciers the size of ice cubes, sinking into extinction on Super Bowl Sunday. Somewhere outside, the ice is melting, dripping tears for generations of our children's unborn children. We are aborting gardens of sustenance, modifying the genes of our seeds to feed coarse throats. We can't nurse Mother Earth back to health if our bad credit can't afford her medical. Father Time has foreseen every disaster brewing and is turning his face backwards. All the cash money in the world will never be enough to hold back the tide of our end game. Hell will overheat before it freezes over. And soon, none of us will have anything to do with folded paper, but fan ourselves and pray for mercy from a world on fire, bloated from swallowing the sun. Thanks, you guys. I, thank you for um, allowing me this opportunity to share our poetry. And, um, and thanks to Camille for uh, giving us her time for her family dinner. And um, thank you again for this opportunity. I'm going to um, mute myself, but I'll be watching you guys. All right. Aloha. Mahalo, Travis, Tia, and Camille for sharing your, your powerful work that speaks to uh, so many of the themes of this anthology. And as I said, we're, we're honored to include your voices and, and thankful you can share, share them with us today, Mahalo. All right, so next up our uh, next reader is a daughter of Guahan or Guam. Mary Therese Paris Hattori is one of nine children of Paul Mitsuo Hattori, who was originally of Kalihi, Hawaii. And Fermina Leon Guerrero Paris, familiar in Titang of Chalampago, Guam. Dr. Hattori is acting director of the Pacific Islands Development Program in the East West Center and is affiliate faculty for the University of Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. I know you've had a busy uh, schedule this weekend, so we're so honored to have you. Thank you. Thanks to Travis T and Kameli uh, for the inspiring, energizing poetry. And thank you to everyone uh, for being here. I want to, uh, before I share my poetry, I want to share a favorite quote from a fellow Chamorro poet, Cecilia Perez, because it really speaks to 
the inspiration for much of the literature uh, in this publication, and uh, certainly um, uh, is, expresses a common feeling across uh, many of the authors and islands that we represent. Lee Paris says, uh, e Manumoro, the Chamorro people have many histories in these ancestral homelands we know as the Marianas. The land, seas, and heavens have a memory of their own that is revealed through the Chamorro mind and senses. So what we see in this anthology is that across Oceania, our land, seas, and heavens have a memory uh, that it's a source. Uh, those are sources of knowledge for us. Uh, and I'm very honored to be part of this anthology and to share this um, kind of um, belief and this way of knowing, a way of being with the rest of the world. The first poem I'm going to share is uh, from a different uh, anthology. It's actually from Local Voices, a fest Festival of Pacific Arts and Culture publication, uh, which was published in Guam in 2016 when our island was the host. And uh, I was um, honored to share this there. Uh, I think Craig opened the uh, literary events on Guam, and I was honored to be there with him and share this poem. It's called e pilunia, which is a Spanish word for a feather. Uh, there are a lot of Spanish loan words in the Chamorro language. So it's called the feather. From a still and empty sky, a lone feather emerges. The down of a bird descends gradually, slowly, gently. It floats down, 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 alighting onto my outstretched palm. A soft, sweet kiss from the Aniti, the spirits. A powerful portent, a message, Malik, good, Toto Malik, all is well. Perhaps my Tata, our name for my grandfather, now a Tauta Mona spirit, always a Pikaru, a brat, plucked it from a passing bird and sent it as a gift, a feather drifting on the ciceration of Sina the whispers of wise elders. Thank you. Uh, this next poem is from one of the other anthologies that Craig uh, co-edited, uh, A Labor of Love, and um, the first anthology of indigenous um, Micronesian literature. It's, it's called Indigenous Literatures for Micronesia, and I just popped the link in there from uh, UH Press. Like many Pacific Islanders, uh, dealing with uh, loss of language is uh, a reality for us. I uh, moved to Hawaii in the 1980s and um, moved at a time where there weren't that many Chamorro people. Uh, I was only 18 and I grew up on Guam at a time when there are many in, in general conversation at home, uh, in schools, people speak both English and Chamorro and the words are all intermingled. And as a young person, you don't really know, you're not aware that a word is English or Chamorro. Uh, but I gained that awareness very rudely when I moved to Hawaii, which for me was a, the first experience of both racism and sexism. And I was often uh, bullied, uh, teased, actually yelled at um, by people, classmates, um, teachers, other people who uh, demanded that because I'm in America that I needed to speak English only. And so over time I stopped speaking uh, any, <clears throat> sorry, any words in my language. So this poem is called uh, Finu Gualafon and it's, it's called uh, Moonlight, Moonlight Talk. And it was an allegorical language, a language that has actually been lost over time. Some say it was a language of secret, lo uh, secret love songs, uh, a language that lovers would speak in the moonlight. So this is a tribute to that lost language and to all of you, all of us who are trying to sustain our indigenous languages and to people like Craig and his co-authors who give us platforms to do that. Finugulafon, Moonlight Talk. On the seashore, in moonlight encounters, we share sunlight in our kisses, starlight in our breath. 
bodies are palimpsests onto which beauty is registered again and again and again. We are Tasi, the ocean, an infinite source of ink with which we pen poems of love. We are Longit, the heavens. Via Lactea, the Milky Way galaxy flows between our legs. Our passion creates constellations of pleasure in our secret skies. Thank you. And this last poem is from the uh, Indigenous Pacific Islander Eco Poetry. And uh, it's um, one that was actually inspired when I was on Guam, uh, actually listening to Craig and other poets uh, during the Festival of Pacific Arts and Culture. And it's uh, called Kantantasi, Song of the Sea. And one of the words that uh, is in this uh, poem is uh, a command that many Chamorro uh, youth hear throughout childhood. It's ekonguk, uh, which means listen. So it's an imperative that our, our aunties and uncles and our parents tell us over and over, ekonguk, listen. We acknowledge that it's by listening um, that we learn. Silence in the midst of our manyaina, our elders, is a virtue. Uh, and in this poem, I, I express this belief that it is by listening to our manyaina, our wise elders, by listening to our environment uh, that we learn. And it also connects us, the sea connects us to our uh, ancestors. Kantantasi, Song of the Sea. Ekunguk, to Kantantasi, the Song of the Sea. Manyaina in soto voce murmurs, send wisdom in sea foam, power atop waves that embrace the shore, salty sea spray kisses across my face. Ekunguk, listen. Minetkut guinaiza linatla, strength, love, life. Minetkut guinaiza linatla, strength, love, life. Delivered by ocean currents, umbilical arteries nurturing me as the song of the sea echoes the sound of my coursing blood. Ekunguk, listen. Mahalo. Mary, Mahalo. Thank you for sharing those amazing poems and uh, for mentioning those other anthologies that your your work uh, appears in. Appreciate you connecting us to uh, the arteries of, of the land and, and waters that connect us all as well. Thank you. All right, our next reader is Mahealani Perez Went, a native Hawaiian author who lives on the island of Maui. She was a recipient of the Elliott Cades Award for Literature in 1993, and her work has been published in many literary journals and anthologies. She's the author of the poetry collection Uluhai Malama in 2008, and the co-editor of Ho'olalea, celebrating 10 years of Pacific writing in 2012. Her poem Voyage appears in the preface to the law textbook Native Hawaiian Law, a Treatise, 2015. She's reti she retired as the executive director of the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, where she worked for more than 30 years. Mahalo, Mahalani, for joining us today. Aloha and uh, mahalo nui to all of you for uh, being here and for organizing this beautiful event. Uh, Roger, thank you. Uh, not sure if you're listening. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, when I heard uh, Travis and Kamele, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I have some piss off poems <laughs> and I grabbed some, you know, but I think I'm going to stay with my original <laughs> plan. Um, but I mahalo you folks. That was so dynamic and beautiful. I just loved it. Um, and also you, you um, Mary Th uh, Therese, thank you, mahalo nui. Um, so, um First of all, I wanted to um, honor the memory of Nate Yuen, a uh, photo um, journalist and a um, naturalist, 
a warrior for the environment who passed away um, two months ago in an accident while, while hiking. Um, his, uh, the photo uh, in my virtual background was taken by Nate Yuen, and I have a, um, a, a substantial collection uh, that he allowed me to um, download from his um, social media website. I'm such a big fan. I was just heartbroken. And so I want to um, remember him um, with my portion of this reading. Uh, God bless you, Nate, and rest in peace. We miss you so much. Also, um, I wanted to also remember a, a beautiful poet and um, artist. His name is Ruben Tam. He's from my home island, Kauai, and he was a um, artist, poet, and teacher. And he, um, I'm just quoting from his book. His he, there's a book um, that was published posth posthumously, "The Wind Honed Islands Rise." And it says that his works are in the permanent collections of over 40 museums. And he's just a beautiful and accomplished artist. And so I also wanted to honor him. Um, sorry, wait one moment, sorry. Um, by reading his, one of his poems, I'm gonna introduce my reading by reading his poems. And this poem is called, Each Step You Take. Each step you take will send up the earth as you walk the path from the hill to the river. You will be striding the crust of land. You will tread on accretions of silt and grasses and leaves in brown angles and tangles. Regard each step. You will cross sills of red clays. You are entering silica and breccia and feldspar, skimmed from deep epochs of fire and cooling. You will walk in the dust of the last drought and the slurry of tumbled stone plains in the climates that a hill has collected and pre pressed between the layers of your path. How many forests have shared this slope with alternating lavas that not, now lie down among foxtail pollen and tufts of nut grass? Walk lightly. Hear the grains of sand sifting under you the small fractures of shale and twig, muffle of purslane and amaranth, and the earth touching you, bearing you in the scratch of your passing. That's by Ruben Tam. And I just love his work. Everything he writes is about landscape and everything he paints is about landscape. Um, and so um, the first poem I'd like to share is Ulupo, which was written for the uh, state historic site Aheao that is part of the Koi Nui Agricultural Complex in Kailua, Oahu. Ulupo, reverence this place, its proud assembly of stone from firmament above and earth's hidden places. Sun in its heaven coaxed the first fires, formed shapes coarse and black. Love too was formed here, and from our father's coarser hands the heavy monuments were laid. Morning rises resplendent, sun signals rain and shrouds the distant hills. This day, Hawahine caresses the sacred garden. This was written for Mahalo. Uh, it's called Nu'u written for Nu'u Refuge in Kaupo, Maui. It's an 82 acre preserve and home to um, a wetland for, of native birds. Uh, we, were asked to, um, we were asked to write poems for different reserves around um, the island. And I wasn't sure I could do this, but I did write Nu'u, so I hope you uh, like it. Um, it's also part of the King's Trail. No, you spoke once of running through sands of thorn, through gauntlet of kiave trees prized for the savers of their wood fires. An island boy who could not abide shoes no matter the stain. Here again, that same coarse ground, thorns, kiave, their kindling shade, 
and the surround of names inhospitable. Pu'u ma neo neo arid, barren, lai o apole, volcanic and cindered, lapehu, swollen, afflicted, but not far away a broad healing meadow, green respite for the wary. These are kinder times, warning signs are posted for visitors, their tires far from the fires. Oceanward, a detrital bay bordered with accretions of sand, boulder and stone, once hoisted on broad shoulders for the building of ancient heiau, temples, oracle towers, lananu'u ma'amau, and the second sacred elevation called nu'u, platform for the consecrated and deified. Their images perhaps incised, the ones outlined with red ochre, the red reserved for chiefly ones. Upon the inland basalt steeps, the ancient glyphs of Nu'u. See Keikukini, the chief's messenger, Keikoa, his spear-wielding warrior, temple dancers poised, ai ha'a, a mother and child beatific, quarried animals, pigs, dogs, starfish, stingrays, turtles, gods who were birds, birds who were human. All were here with their prayers, chants, stories. Fishers, farmers, hunters, gatherers, skilled navigators, negotiators who survived the caprice of royal chiefs, of rival chiefs, their internecine wars back and forth across the Alinui Ha Ha, channel of great billows smashing. The ancient inscriptions also bearing witness to gods in the temporal realms, as when the companions Kane and Kanaloa, scion of water, scion of sea together, summoned forth the sacred springs of Nu'u, Oyana. Nu'u's sweeping winds blow heady this way and that, surly and affecting as chiefs. Their inconstancy joined with winds of surrounding Kaupo, Kaino, Kowape, Pahaku, land of the rain that makes one hide behind rocks. The rain's indifference, intermittency, a fitful source of replenishment for Nu'u springs and dreams that someday the I.O. Alaikea, Koa'ekea, the white-tailed tropic birds will return their fluttering and nestling noises below Lualailua, place of peace and double enjoyment. Beyond the teeming village, a scintillate sea, its precipitous depths, ha uli uli, dark and unfathomable, surround of bay, shining cliffs, boulders, escarpments, rise along the flanks of Haleakala to its summit. This too is Nu'u's meaning, an exalted rain realm of white floating clouds, of white-tailed tropic birds, where Maui reposes in the calm of blossoming sun. Mahalo. Um, do I have time for one, one more? Alrighty. Um, prayer for peace. I pray you creators, gods who wage furious peace, Keakua Jehovah Yahweh, Jesus, Allah, Buddha, gods of unknowable, unfathomable love, gods of unknowable, unfathomable fire, gods who know our suffering, gods who know our attachment, gods who teach us equanimity, gods blissful in the fullness of spirit. I humble before you am one who rages, one who rebukes your unfinished handiwork, I am one ecstatic in the garden, wild and flowered, your rainbow-filled paradise. I, humble before you, am also the troubled occupant of a harrowing place, much burdened by sorrow. I see your great mountains perfect in their accoutrements, lush forests, white mantles of snow, floating lovelinesses, with fissures bursting, clear streams, blue mirrored lakes and teeming within life's plenitude, earth's bounty. 
all one can conceive of, all one can dream of earthly paradise. But here too are planted dark seeds in the hearts of your most prolific citizens of earth humankind, wherein dwells a black thing, evil, rooted, growing, aggressing its way toward carnage, O oh gods, and fateful destruction. On that fateful day, all of creation, your great mountains will recede, its forests, flowers, rivers, lakes, rainbows, grasses, swallowed up, and all earth a fire. O oh, ye gods, I pray you creators who wage furious peace, teach us how to save earth we love as heaven. Show us the path to your great peace. Mahalo. Mahalo, Mahalani. That was so amazing to hear your work as well as uh, the other works that you've shared, you know, including the, the amazing photography in the background. Really grateful to have your voice in this anthology and, and here today. Mahalo. Well, thank you. Mahalo. And you know, thank you everyone for, for joining us uh, on the Sunday night. We have about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, to ask these amazing writers uh, some questions. And so if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, as you're thinking of something, I'll ask the first question and maybe uh, throw it to, to Travis first and then Mary and then uh, Mahail Lani. You know, when we were putting together this anthology, uh, we were thinking about, of course, you know, the role that literature can have in, in writing about the environment. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about um, you know, the role that, that you see in your own poetry or writing, um, you know, and, and its relationship to the environment. And so whether you see literature, you know, as a place to kind of honor uh, the lands and waters or to, uh, you know, to critique environmental devastation and, and so on, or perhaps as a way to reconnect, um, you know, to, to the ecologies of the Pacific and so on. So just curious to hear any of your thoughts about that. Um, would you mind getting us started, Travis? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for me personally, I, I'm just, I do a lot of writing regularly, you know, as a teacher and as a, um, as a writing coach. And so I'm always constantly just processing whatever it is I'm thinking anyway into poetry. And sometimes, yeah, it's about the environment. Um, Sometimes I see something like, and I have this idea, like for that poem, the ice is melting in particular. It's like this idea that just in my head somewhere, I, I, the ice is melting for the last time is like this idea. It's like this image that I always would, would just carry with me. And so sometimes a poem just naturally happens from this one image that won't leave my, you know, frame of mind or reference. And it's just something that I constantly think about like the great Pacific garbage patch, how it's just, it's just growing and it's, you know, twice the size of Texas. It's like this thing that exists in the world and it's just, it's out there. It's just like, I feel like environmental issues, climate change, stuff like that is just like omnipresent. It's just always on my mind anyway. So I think when I write from the perspective of a Pacific Islander in, in particular, that like, I can't, I can't help but end up talking about something that's related to the Aina related to the earth, related to the environment anyway. So I, I never really make, I mean, I think to me even like class warfare is related to the Aina. You know? um, that, that's how I think about it. I would love to pass the mic though. Mahal, what do you think? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, I, you know, because I'm um, older, and I've been around a while. Um, I see Aina and the natural environment. It's just a, a you know an inextricable part of who I am, and so I think it informs everything, every single thing. Um, it's almost like it's um, not almost. It's like it's like Mama Earth, you know, and it's cradle and suckering you, and it's giving you the luxury of um, sort of wandering and, and uh, imagining, and you may think that uh, it has, it's unrelated or unconnected, but I don't think so. I think all of it comes because we're part of nature 
and um, that we're informed, our spirits are informed by this heavenly place where we live. And by the way, I happen to believe that all of our planet is beautiful, no matter where. Um, I, you know, I just, I think it's a blessing. Some, some of it, of course, is more hospitable to human life than other places, but I'm grateful to live where I live, but I just think earth is beautiful. And I think this sense of imminent, um, you know, existential threat, um, it really sort of takes you, takes you there. It takes you to a place of, um, profound appreciation for who we are on this planet. So anyway, that's my two cents. Yes, mahalo, can I bring uh, Mary into the conversation? Sure, thank you. I, I think for me, my, my poetry, especially the um, eco poetry really speaks to a connection, as Mahalani said, you know, there's disconnection. So, so I hope that my work can help people understand uh, just how important it is to feel more connected. Our uh, the lockdowns uh, and the um, time on screen, even even uh, times like this, uh, can uh, make us feel more disconnected to the, the planet. And I think that the, um, the body is an uh, instrument to sense the world. Our, our ancestors knew this. Uh, we islanders know this. We can sense when the rains are coming. We can smell it. Uh, we can sense our way through uh, the jungle and the brush, brush just by, um, by smell and heat. Um, we are part of nature, um, and so that's that's part of the motivation uh, for me is to just uh, celebrate our connectedness to uh, the ocean and the rest of the planet. And hopefully, if we feel more connected, we're less likely to continue to harm the planet. Yes, thank you. Thanks to all three of you. That, that was beautiful. Beautiful answers really, you know, resonates with what you're saying about reconnecting us to, to really the sacredness of the lands and waters as a way to kind of cultivate a new kind of environmental ethics, right, that are really embodied uh, in many of our, of our traditional cultures. And so with that said, maybe I wanted to ask you just one more question. Um, if, you know, of course, you talk about eco literature and eco poetry, and this being the first anthology, um, bringing this work together. But as we know, our, our ancestors have been been composing, uh, you know, many different kinds of arts that have environmental messages or, or values and, and customs. And so, I wonder if you could touch on uh, what you see in, in, in both Hawaiian and, and Chamorro cultures. Uh, particularly like art forms, whether it's mele or hula or chant, and what you see as the, the environmental messages in these traditions, in our cultures, and what they perhaps can, can teach us today. Maybe Travis, would you mind getting us started again? Um, well, I mean, for me, I think, um, you know, part of my grad school experience was I guess like learning a little bit more about Hawaiian forms of poetry and different Hawaiian you know, genre of, of oli and mele and getting to be a little bit more familiar with like, um, I guess the meivi, you know, like the bones, the, the sort of the um, well, rhetorical tools of Hawaiian poetry and literature and sort of like changing how I thought about description, pattern, um, breath, repetition in particular, and the idea of like how nature repeats itself, you know, like when waves break on the ocean, um, when, when waves break on the shore, or um, when birds return to different places through migration, and just the, the, the way that the cycles work, and I hadn't ever really thought of that, because, you know, in the Western academic sort of sense of literature, like repeating yourself is kind of like a no-no, right, redundant or repetitive, you know, like all of these words, but of course, in, a, in an oral tradition, repeating something actually gives it resonance, 
It gives it mana, it gives it energy, it builds in an idea that you're gonna walk away with as opposed to a text in a book that you get to read later. It's about what you remember from a poem. And so I think there's been, for me, like my sort of cultural, I guess, becoming more aware of different styles and, and genres of like Hawaiian poetry has made me more aware of how I process and, and um, I guess this describe my own experience. Whereas before I was very, I don't wanna say um, hypersensitive to the idea of redundancy, repetition and so on. But now I just feel like no, that, that's actually like my secret sauce. That's my tool now. I use that as like my writing, you know, prompts. I just shoot again and I shoot again and I shoot again because so many of our chant only melee was very repetitive, you know, and for a reason or for a point because it was spoken word. And so I think that's how I start to think now. I don't know if like this is the answer to what the original question was, but <laughs> this is how I feel that my Pacific Islanderness informs the art that I do and how the art that I produce informs the way I think every day now. It's changed. And that's why I think everyone should go to grad school. <laughs> I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo, Travis. Yeah, I love thinking about repetition in, in poetry as you know an embodiment of environmental cycles, waves crashing or, or birds returning to their nesting grounds, and so on. Um, Mary, did you want to want to speak to to this question as well? Sure. I think that there are some um, forms of performance, poetry, and song uh, in in Chamorro and in Hawaiian cultures where it's a an echo where someone, it's a call and, and a response. Sometimes it's a call and repeat, but often it's its a call and response. Sometimes those are competitive. Um, what I like about that is that, that where um, we practice uh, our oral traditions, our poetry, our song and our chant as collectives. So I think in the modern day, um, I was just in a poetry event uh, on Friday at the uh, Dorsuk Theater with um, three other poets, uh, Fijian, Rotuman, and uh, uh, Native Hawaiian. And so we, and, and this is similar, it, it's our, to me, these are our modern uh, day versions of that. We aren't um, chanting or performing poems in, in, uh, in a large group, but we are doing this as a collective. I think a lot of uh, Pacific Islander poets um, we'll do that. You see that happening, uh, these kinds of uh, gatherings where we're sharing our work with each other and we're presenting, uh, sharing with, with others as a, uh, some sort of a collective and, and then creating these networks, um, uh, which is great. So I think that that, um, that form of collective celebration of our arts and our, our poetry is important. Uh, I also see that the using the words of our languages, the words of our ancestors, speaking the names of our people, the words of our people brings an energy, a kana in tomorrow, uh, uh, mana into the work. And we tap into the mana of our ancestors um, past uh, and into the future. And so I think that that strand or that element of oral traditions is, is really important. And it's so hard for that to come through, perhaps impossible when we rely on the written, the printed text, as Travis says. So I love these opportunities to actually put the breath back into our, into our words and share breath with everyone uh, here. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you for, for talking about kind of the, the collective nature of much of Pacific arts. Um, that's kind of how we we see this anthology too as as a gathering as a collection of voices um and there are many works you know that include pacific languages and you know as you point out there's there's so many environmental and, and cultural lessons embedded uh in, in many pacific languages that you know speaking them and, and and learning learning them can can teach us so much about uh our traditional knowledges uh, Mahalani, would you like to add add anything to? Mm, just briefly, um, I hear music when I write poetry. 
my the very first reading I did, I uh, did a chant because the work suggested it. And I've done this throughout the years and I still do it. Um, I don't pander to it. I don't try to write things so that I can do a chant. But I have had training uh, since I was a young, you know, like many local um, people, I've had training in hula and chant. So when appropriate, um, and if it suggests, I will do a chant. So for example, Nu'u, uh, Maui, reposing in the blossoming sun, Malie Maui Kiahuvali Maila Kaihui Akala. That's the literal, almost a literal translation. And that in itself is a chant. And if I were doing uh, an in-person kind of thing, I would probably do that chant because it's suggested by it. Um, also, the, um, the repetition, of course, assists with memory because, for example, uh, the 2,000 plus lines of the Kumulipo, uh, repetition is a way of remembering. And so um, that is, you know, also something that I incorporate into my poetry to make it more emphatic, to make, you know, to put up uh, uh, exclamation point and, you know, so, um, yeah, I agree with what everybody said and those are my two cents. Mahalo Nui. Yes, Mahalo. And thank you for bringing up the, the Kumulipo. It's such a great example of, um, you know, how, how our, our genealogies are, are connected and, and come from the, the environment as well. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. The, <laughs> that's the quintessential, we yes. are the environment poem. Yes, yes. I love that you mentioned that. And, and thank you all for your very powerful and, and insightful answers. Um, and of course, for your, your profound and inspiring poetry today. Thank you to everyone who, who came out to join us and to witness uh, the beauty in, in poetry and, and what it can teach us about the environment at a time where we really do need to, uh, as Mary says, ekungok or listen uh, to, to our, our sacred lands and waters and of course to, to fight to, to protect them from exploitation. Uh, with that said, I wanna uh, turn it back over to Roger. Aloha, that was uh, fascinating, very moving. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I put in the chat uh, where, you, where you and your ohana can experience this panel again. Or if you'd like to forward it, to it there's a, a link there I put in there. Craig, uh, thank you again for what always seems an incredibly relaxed uh, moderating um, <laughs> on very tense subjects. <laughs> um, and I, I really appreciate what you do. It's just extraordinary. Thank you so much. Um, I have one uh, final pitch, which is we, will, we have every hope of being in person again next year. It takes a lot of funding. We have a fundraiser on January the 26th, so please put that in the calendar. I'll be reminding people endlessly about it. Um, and um, thank you again. I hope to see you again next year. Hello.